It certainly is a big honour to be asked to be given the uh, Joel Lecture, particularly on this, this 100th anniversary of the Joel Chair. Um, as Robert said, I've, I've just come off a, an 11 year stint of, of being head of department and I, I can't say I was particularly excited at the prospect of, of, of giving a presentation based on a lot of tired old slides and well-worn anecdotes. So uh, how Robert uh, persuaded me that uh, this would be, be good from maybe give a review of my career and uh, then I started thinking about the directions I'd taken and really what had been my influences both in terms of people and also in terms of work that had been going on at, in the field at the time which kind of influenced the directions I'd taken. So I've decided that my presentation today would, would focus on a handful of, of research papers which have been particularly influential on me of tired old sides and uh, well-worn anecdotes which I'll fit in as well. And therefore, as, as Robert said, um, borrowing from the, the format of, of BBC's Desert Island Discs, I, I give you a Desert Island Docks. <laughs> Hopefully. So your, your castaway today is me. And... Uh, I've chosen eight papers which uh, reflect various influences right from my, my first day as a PhD student. So I'm going to begin my story at Imperial College in 1981. I just finished a degree in physics. I still had ambitions to be an astronaut as everyone else did a degree in physics at that time. And um, I embarked on a PhD in astronomy. And I did it in the uh, Blackett Laboratory, which is this building here. And um, on my first day, my PhD supervisor, Dr. Brian Morgan, he gave me a stack of papers and said, read that lot. And um, these were all to do with a, a new interferometric technique which had been developed in a, a few years beforehand called uh, stellar uh, interferometry. And basically, it's, it was a method of achieving uh, information, making measurements at the diffraction limit of a telescope. So I'm going to say something more about that through my, my first paper, which was written by the, the inventor of this technique, Antoine Labory, who published this paper in 1970 and uh, laid the groundwork for long baseline interferometry in, in optics. The, the, the idea is very simple, which I can condense as, as follows. If we have a, a perfect uh, imaging system without any distortion, we have waves from, from a star entering the aperture of our telescope, then the telescope will produce a, uh, an image which represents, if it's, a, if it's a point star, it will be a point spread function of the telescope. And of course the larger the aperture of the telescope, then the narrower the point spread function, the better resolution that you get and the more detail you can get of the objects you're looking at, whether they be galaxies or, or individual stars and so on. But unfortunately, um, the atmospheric distortion reduces that spatial resolution considerably. So the wavefront that comes from, travels many billions of miles perfectly uniform and then it comes through the atmosphere, a few miles of atmosphere and gets, gets distorted. And that distortion in the wavefront um, then causes the, um, the image to be blurred out. And this blurring out is pretty much the same whether you have a small telescope or a large telescope. And thus the very large telescopes that were being built at that time in the 1980s, um, we couldn't uh, exploit the, the potential for getting high resolution images. Labry's idea was to take very short exposure images of stars, which essentially freezes the distortion in the atmosphere, which has a temporal correlation time of a few tens milliseconds. So if you take a, an image which lasts a few milliseconds, essentially that distortion is frozen. And what you get 
uh, you get interference occurring from different parts across that wavefront, which produces a, an interference pattern consisting of multiple point spread functions, albeit uh, photon noise dominated. Uh, <laughs> Uh, images and these these multiple images, which is what we call speckles, and these speckles, I say, have a correlation time of a few uh, tens of milliseconds. So the idea was to record very short exposure images of um, of interesting stellar objects. Uh, and then process them in order to measure their sizes and uh, obtain information at the diffraction limit of the telescope. And one of the highlights of my PhD was to travel to the, the Siding Spring Observatory in New South Wales. It's about 500 kilometres from Sydney in the outback. Uh, it's actually a very beautiful uh, area surrounded by kangaroos, woken up by kangaroos uh, outside the dormitory every morning. And uh, I got to use this telescope, which is the largest telescope on the site. It's the four-meter Anglo-Australian telescope. This is the telescope inside the dome. It's a bit hard to uh, appreciate just what the scale of this thing is. So the actual mirror is right down the bottom here. That's four meters. This is a very big structure. And um, it was uh, my task to spend the night in the cage at the bottom of the telescope. So this is the, the rear end of the telescope. So the, the, the primary mirror is up here. There's a hole in the mirror here where the, where the light finally comes through. So you put your detection optics up here. And we were recording um, images on videotape. So as the telescope swings about pointing at different objects in the sky, someone had to sit inside this cage at the bottom of the telescope to make sure that the video recorder was always level. They didn't tilt over, the telescope tilt over. So that was my job. I mean, what are PhD students for? <laughs> so, and I'd spent all night in there, and this was the, the Australian winter time, so the nights were quite cold and quite long. And uh, occasionally I was allowed out to have a hot cup of coffee and then I'd go back in the cage. Okay, get on with it. There's only another eight hours to go. And um, so I collected uh, a lot of data this way, and, and it was quite a successful project. And uh, we, we, um, we, we published quite a few things. Um, another highlight of my PhD time was to attend a workshop in, uh, in Oracle, Arizona. So um, it was held at a at a Spanish villa that had been built by the Countess of the then Countess of Suffolk, or actually recently deceased Countess of Suffolk. And um, she obviously wanted to live in the Arizona sunshine, but she took a lot of England with her. And right in the middle of the Arizona desert, she created, created a, uh, an English garden. And so beautiful lawns, uh, English trees and flowers, it had to be heavily watered to keep them alive. Uh, and she had this beautiful house. And when she died, she uh, gave the, uh, the estate to the University of Arizona. And that's where this, um, this conference was held, known as the, the Casa del Rio, the, the House of Gold, later known as Suffolk House. Actually, this site was later used for the biosphere. I don't know if every, any of you remember the biosphere. I think in 1991, they locked up uh, a bunch of, I think, eight people for two years to simulate life. Uh, uh, for distant exploration of planets, what it would be like to have a self-sufficient environment. I think they all went crazy in the end, but anyway. Um, anyway, it was at this, uh, this workshop that I met the author of my second chosen paper. And uh, this, he's known, he called himself Pete, Pete Warden. Um, Pete Warden was someone who had the charisma that filled a room. He was uh, amazing. He, in fact, he wouldn't stop telling you how amazing he was. <laughs> um, but I, I really like that about him, actually. He, he'd recently completed a PhD in astronomy at the University of Arizona. He joined the US Air Force. He clearly had an eye on getting onto the NASA and, uh, astronaut training program, which, as far as I know, he never made it that far. Um, but he did tell everyone at the conference that he intended to become a general by the time he was 40. And um, nevertheless, he had a very successful career at NASA. He became director of the Ames, um, what's it called, the, the Ames Research Center, 
in California. Now, in fact, this is on his retirement from uh, that directorship meeting uh, uh, President Obama in 2015. Anyway, um, Pete, uh, at, at this conference, presented uh, something that was, I was very impressed by. Uh, at that point in my PhD project, we never had the capacity to do imaging. We were only doing measurements, of, of distance measurements. We didn't have the facility to make images. And what he presented was images. So his, his technique, which was very simple, he, he, he got these uh, speckle images, these short exposure images of stars. He then used um, some kind of computer algorithm to identify, identify the brightest speckles, so the 20 brightest. He then find the centers of those speckles, and then centrally he would deconvolve those 20 speckle images with these 20, uh, essentially the locations of those speckles. And that deconvolution then produced one big speckle, which was uh, uh, the image. And um, this technique enables him to, to produce this image of a gamma orionis, which essentially is a point source, and alpha orionis, which is a, a supergiant star, which, which, is, which is resolvable with, with large telescopes. And he was able to just show that, um, that uh, uh, alpha orionis was, was, was clearly larger. And uh, of course, this was, this was uh, very impressive. To make it even more impressive, um, he produced uh, this image. Um, and um, this is totally forced color. Uh, what what uh, Pete did is he essentially got his, his image. He then cut around it to give it a circular hard border because people expect to see a star to have a nice hard border. And um, he freely admitted that these these little features on here, well below the resolution limit of the telescope. But nevertheless, he released that to the press. And it, 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 it uh, the term you'd use nowadays is it went viral. And it was, it, it, um, it was published in quite a few newspapers. And if you went into the gift shop at any of the leading observatories, you could buy a t-shirt with that image on and a mug. <laughs> and some of you might uh, know uh, Chris Dainty, and Chris Dainty, who was a professor at Imperial College at the time I did my PhD, he, had, he got a poster of that and he pinned it up on his, uh, his office wall. Um, I should say that uh, the fact that the detail here is, uh, is, 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 is well below what could possibly be resolved and that outside boundary is purely artificial, you don't become a general if you let physics get in the way of a good story. <laughs> Um, before I go on, let me just say a little bit about Alpha Orionis. It's also known as Betelgeuse. It's, um, it's a red supergiant star. It has a, its photosphere, that's its visible sphere, is larger than the orbit of Mars. So it's a very big star. Um, it's also not very dense. It's only about 10 times more massive than the sun. But it, say its radius is truly enormous. Uh, beyond the photosphere, it also has an extended hydrogen atmosphere. Uh, which uh, emits um, um, light at a particular uh, interesting lines. And although the star is comparatively young, only, only 9 million years old, uh, it's, it's very short-lived. And uh, it is a star that almost certainly will go supernovae at some point, at any point, in fact. And uh, when it does, it'll be a, something that will be visible in the daytime to us uh, on Earth. If you want to find uh, Orionis, you only have to look south and in the winter time. It's a, uh, um, it's a, the southern sky in the winter is dominated by the Orion um, constellation, and uh, Alpha Orionis Betelgeuse is the very obviously pink star on the top left. So the, the workshop I'd attended was hosted by a local astronomer whose name was Keith Heggie, and um, I, uh, he he uh, offered me a postdoctoral position at the end of my PhD, which I gladly accepted. And uh, this, is, this is me. This is uh, Keith Heggie and uh, another astronomer I was working with, uh, Julian. And uh, it was, uh, I had a fantastic time. It was a very productive time. Uh, published a lot of work, did some really interesting things. So I'm just going to highlight a, a few things. Uh, it was... Um, my, my project involved using what was then the world's largest telescope. This is the multiple mirror telescope, which instead of having a single large mirror, had six smaller mirrors uh, for several reasons. 
most obvious reason, it's easier to get six small mirrors up a mountain than one large mirror. Um, nevertheless, with careful optical design, this mirror had, um, although it had the light collection power equivalent to a single 4.5 metre telescope, it had the resolving power, the potential resolving power, equivalent to a 6.86 metre telescope, well beyond anything that then existed um, in the 1980s. So it was my job, uh, one of my jobs, to try and exploit that, to see if we could achieve something at the diffraction limit of this enormous telescope on the top of, of Mount Hopkins. It's about, uh, it's, it's about two hours' drive south of Tucson. So the way, in order to get this telescope to operate as, uh, as if it had if it really truly was a 6.8 meter telescope, it's important that the light paths from uh, the objects to the detector all coincide within the coherence length, which for the kind of uh, filters we were using meant less than a millimeter. So that was really a big engineering challenge, and it's amazing that this, this thing really uh, did work. So with um, really quite remarkable uh, robustness in the design of the, uh, of, of the multiple mirror telescope, we were able to achieve this condition such that we could combine all these, these light paths to within that coherence length. The, the fine tuning was done by inserting pairs of, of prisms into the beam, which we would do interactively. So you would do that until, with, with pairs of mirrors until you could see fringes, then you do that with it, all respect to one mirror, then you add the lot together to get the telescope operating as a single array. The, um, my, my specific project um, involved implementing a, a technique that we called differential speckle interferometry, which we can consider this to be an extension of um, Pete Warden's idea, except that we would extract the speckle positions from the broadband photospheric speckles, so you use the nice broadband to see where the speckles are, and then we would then um, produce more uh, astronomically interesting speckle patterns at a narrowband filter corresponding to the hydrogen emission line, that is the large cloud of hydrogen surrounding the star. So this is a relatively tight uh, speckle, whereas these is a very dispersed image. And by deconvolving this with this, we hope to get back to producing an image of the hydrogen envelope around the star. Um, so this was a, a pair of examples. It's been recorded on a, on a video. And um, so this is, well, a broadband continuum. It's in the narrow emission line. And um, first of all, we, we tested it just on a a bright, boring point source star. And when you do that, when you implement the technique on a, on a distant star, what you get is essentially the point uh, spread function of the telescope. Now, that's actually quite, quite boring, uh, you, you'd think. However, in fact, this is the, the image we obtained for Gamma Orionis, and this is the computed perfect point spread function, which you see agree very well. And although the image is very boring, that image represented a world record in the resolution achieved for an optical image of any stellar object. And I just wish we'd made more of that at the time. Um, if, I, if I'd been Pete Warden, that would have been on newspaper of a, a newspaper in the world, but we, we kind of did nothing with it, really, uh, apart from just put it in a paper as an addendum to more interesting images. But uh, that was, um, in the history of telescopes, that was a record that had only been established maybe a handful of times since the first telescopes were ever invented and uh, it's probably been only beaten maybe once or twice since. So um, anyway, we didn't make much of it. I would have liked to have seen it on a t-shirt though. These are the images we, ac we acquired using that DSI technique. So this is the image I've essentially just shown of, of Gamma Orionis and this is extended, horrible false colour I really like, appreciate, um, uh, extended atmosphere, hydrogen atmosphere around um, uh, uh, um, um, around Betelgeuse. And it's, there were some nice results. We looked at a few other stars as well. Okay, well, the technique was worked well 
And um, it clearly was laying the foundation of a technique that we now call adaptive optics. And around that time, the US military got really interested in adaptive optics, partly because the possibility of compensating for the atmosphere in, in space-borne lasers to fire through the atmosphere and shoot down missiles and so on. Anyway, um, Keith Heggie and others were, were getting offers of large sums of money from the military to fund uh, the research, but uh, I, I was obviously quite excluded from that because uh, being a non-US citizen, I, I wasn't able to be funded by, by, by that kind of, uh, of work, for that kind of work. So I looked around for other challenges at that time. I didn't want to come back to the UK then. I, I found, enjoyed my time in the US. So I looked around and I inter interviewed for a postdoc position at the University of Utah, the Department of Radiology there. And uh, I met this guy, uh, Robert Kruger, who was head of the Medical Imaging Research Lab there in Utah. And um, Bob was also one of those people whose uh, charisma can fill a room. Um, and he'd made a, a bit of money from a, a, a technique, from a patent that he developed for a technique known as digital subtraction and geography. So he invented that technique, earned quite a bit of money, and he was prepared to invest it in some, into researching something new. That was really the source of the postdoctoral position that I was applying for. Um, I told him that I knew nothing about medical imaging and then I, I realised actually probably that was an advantage as far as Bob was concerned. But he asked me what I did know about and I said, well, I know about optical imaging. He said, good, okay, investigate that then. He said, do that, investigate optical imaging. Um, and he essentially gave me two years to see what I could come up with. It was that free. He said, go on, I'm trusting you to go away, come back and do something with optical imaging and let me know how you get on in two years. So, of course, I began with a literature search. Now I need to choose my, my third paper. Well, one of the first papers I found that initial time was, was this, um, published by Ernst Carlson. It appeared in an issue of a, uh, a magazine called Diagnostic Imaging. And um, it... it um, really said that uh, the, a technique known as breast transillumination really could solve the whole problem of, of uh, imaging early breast cancer uh, without using uh, potentially harmful x-rays. And it, was, it had some very positive results. And uh, well, it showed images like this, it was a healthy breast. It involved nothing more than placing a, a near-infrared source underneath the breast and then recording an image with an infrared sensitive video camera which is then observed on a, on, a, on a VDU. And it showed these images of the healthy breast and then uh, another breast with a, with, a, with a large cancer within it. And I thought, well, that's exciting. It looks like somebody's doing something in this area. Uh, it looks rather positive. I continued my literature search, and then I found this paper. This was published by Barbara Monsies, who's... Uh, uh, a radiologist at Washington University in St. Louis, and uh, she, she essentially poo-pooed the whole thing, really. She got hold of one of these same um, commercial devices that Carlson had used, and she conducted her own study and then compared it directly. Uh, I did a blinded study and compared it with x-rays and found that the, the light scanning achieved a specificity of about 86%, but a sensitivity of only 58%. There was a, a lot of um, false positives, which were actually also acknowledged by in, in Carlson's original paper. I, I contacted Barbara Monsies, who, who then sent me these images, um, um, which don't actually appear in her paper, but uh, I just asked her what, what she'd found. And she sent me these as an example of really why the technique doesn't work. First of all, this and this are both nipples, so ignore that. This here is a a tumour, probably two or three centimetres across inside the breast. This here, whatever it is, is perfectly healthy. And to be honest, they're, they're not very different from each other. And this just illustrates why this transillumination method was never going to work. Now, I can't really select either the Carlson paper or the Monsey's papers to take to my desert island because they kind of cancel each other out. So 
I'm going to select another paper which I found during the same time. And that was this one. This was called X-ray GOGS, Preliminary Evaluation of a New Medical Imaging Modality. Now, I'm sure some of you may have heard of X-ray GOGS. X-ray GOGS were all the rage in children's comics in the 1950s and 1960s. When you put them on, it enables you to, um, to see your bones in your hand, you can see, see through flesh, really quite a remarkable, in fact, scientific marvel of the century. And, uh, of course, they're, they're, it's, it's, not, um, it's not such garbage as you might think, and um, I have a pair here. <laughs> you do realise you're, you're all naked at the moment. <laughs> you can see through clothes as well, which was another big advertising point for the, uh, for the system. Anyway, this was, a, this was a lovely paper. It published in the April 1st uh, edition of the journal. And um, the, the, the guy, the bona fide radiologist that did this study, he was a pediatric <coughs> radiologist, so he worked with small children. And of course, children love this kind of thing. And um, he noticed that X-ray GOGS provided the correct diagnosis in all cases where the conventional study revealed no abnormality, which was 60 patients. So spot on for 60 patients. So no false positives whatsoever. And his conclusion in his paper was because of low cost and lack of ionizing radiation, X-ray GOGS are recommended in all cases where radiography is not normally required, or results of radiographic study will not influence the patient management, or the diagnosis has already been established by other means. <laughs> so, um, anyway, I, I, uh, I love this paper, and uh, I thought, well, I, I really decided that, that transillumination as it then existed was unlikely to, to be better than X-ray GOGS. So I needed to think about doing something different. So um, I started to think about how else could we use light that doesn't just mean just not just shining light through the tissue. And so I, I came up with the idea of, of trying to measure the flight time of photon as it passed through tissue. And uh, so I started doing some computer simulations. And uh, my idea was uh, if we inject um, a pulse of light into the tissue, we measure the time it takes for it to fly through, fly through, then that time of flight distribution would also tell me something about the spatial um, spreading within the tissue. So, so if we have a source of narrow pulses, that spreads out, it scatters throughout the tissue, and we get this distribution of, um, of photons, which we now call a temporal point spread function. So um, I did some simulations that show as you uh, use shorter and shorter photons, it then uh, enhances the spatial resolution that you get across the object. So um, I approached a physicist in the physics department at the University of Utah, who uh, had all the kit I needed, and um, he charged me $100 an hour to use it, which, this was 1988, I think, uh, which seems like a remarkable amount of money, actually. I feel a bit ripped off now. Um, it seems somewhat excessive. However, I did get free use of his postdoc as well, uh, Dr. Cam Wong, and Cam and I worked really well together. And I saw Cam only uh, a couple of years ago, he came, came to UCL to visit me. And we embarked on a very productive period. We did a lot of experiments and uh, published quite a few papers. And I also pub got several large grants and I was offered a permanent position. Uh, just some of the experiments I did, I, I, I made this plastic box, transparent box, I put some little, uh, little plastic transparent targets with some little opaque disks on them at different depths. I filled it with, essentially with milk. I then uh, shone my laser beam across it, scanned it backwards and forwards. Without the milk, of course, you can see the five targets. With the milk, you can only see the targets uh, 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 near each surface. However, by using time resolve, by, by gating the light traveling through and using shorter and shorter time gates, you can then start to see um, the objects in the center of, uh, in center of the target. So a really simple idea. And it, it kind of works, although you soon run out of photons, of course, and it becomes noisier and noisier. <laughs> 
And then we had this journal club uh, in Utah, the Medical Imaging Research Laboratory, and I saw this paper, which is my fourth choice, published in 1988 by a, a group I hadn't heard of. Let, um, this paper was written by someone called Dave Delpy, and uh, this, um, this paper published, appearing in PMB used exactly the kit that I was using in Utah. And uh, this group was measuring the time of flight of photons through tissue. It's specifically, I think it's the head of a rat, wasn't it, Dave? And um, I thought, wow, somebody else is as mad as me. They do this, this sort of thing. And, um, uh, and I, I was very excited by that. And uh, a few years later, in 1991, I attended a, a conference in Los Angeles where I met Dave and his team. And um, I also was blown away by a particular presentation by, by, uh, by Simon Arridge, which described how um, this, uh, how imaging across diffuse tissues could be, uh, that had a, a robust imaging algorithm for, for reconstructing the images. And uh, this laid the foundation for, for TOAST, which is Simon's internationally leading work in this area. And quite rightly, Simon is, is, is seen as the, the father of diffuse optical tomography, with the amazing work he's done in the development of TOAST. <laughs> so uh, um, having made this contact with, with Simon and Dave, and so this is, this is TOAST as it appears today on the website. It's remarkable software. Um, I then approached Dave, I think that in the summer of 91, I, I travelled over to London, visited Dave, and I said, Dave, I really think I really need to join your group because you're clearly doing everything I'm doing, but I'm, I'm really a group of one over in Utah, but you've got a large group, this is clear, I, I need to join, uh, come here, how can I do that? And Dave said, well, try applying for some fellowships. So I did, I applied to EPSSC and Wellcome Trust, and actually I got both, I was really lucky, and I, I chose the Wellcome one, it was more money, and uh, I, I came and joined UCL in November 1992. And um, here I am in the, the laser lab with my PhD student David uh, in the laser lab of what was, what was Shropshire House. I can't say I have particularly four memories of Shropshire House, <laughs> but uh, we, did some, we did some really interesting work. Um, and um, Dave and I also secured a, a grant from the Wellcome Trust to build a time-resolved imager so we could take the technique or time-resolved imaging into the clinic. And um, this became what we call the monster technique. However, we weren't the first to do this. And I'm going to come to my, my sixth choice, which is a, a paper by Susan Hintz and David Benaren uh, at Stanford University. David Benaren actually published a paper, I think in 93, which described the hardware of his time-resolved imaging instrument. He was interested, that he, he and Susan were both um, um, paediatricians, they're interested in imaging uh, the, the newborn infant brain. And his line of thinking was identical to what we were, we were thinking at that time. And he built this system which involved placing a, a ring of optical fibers around the circumference of the head. And uh, unfortunately, he had just a single detector. Uh, I think he might have had more than one source, but a single detector. You illuminate one source and you can measure one detector. And thus, to get sufficient images to do a tomographic slice, he'd have to move his detector from fiber to fiber. And for that reason, his scan times were many hours. Uh, the paper doesn't appear to say the number of hours, but I remember in discussions, it was the order of six, seven hours to get, to get a, 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 a total brain image, which uh, nevertheless, it was fantastic work. I, I really admire the, the whole spirit, which they, uh, the daring of the work. The algorithm was a bit iffy as well. They didn't have toast. They uh, did some basic back projection, which uh, a bit hard to justify, but nevertheless, it showed some gross abnormalities uh, on each side of the brain, which were consistent with the existence of uh, hemorrhage. So, back at UCL, this is the monster system that we built. 
And uh, Monster was an acronym, but also it was appropriate given the size of the instrumentation. It was all originally meant to be housed in this single rack, but then we found we needed an additional rack. We also needed a cooling system, which is not peering here. Um, another PC, and this is, that's a real baby, I think, and that's a real nurse. And uh, we, we, did some, um, we did some really interesting scans over at uh, the neonatal unit. Uh, UCLH. My, my main concentration at that time was, was to do imaging that was intensity free. The problem with measuring intensity is you've got a problem with coupling. As the light travels into the tissue, the coupling, how much of the light enters the tissue depends on how hard you press. If you move slightly, the amount of light going in varies. Coupling is a, is a, is a huge problem. It varies all the time. And uh, babies won't necessarily keep, keep absolutely still. So I was very keen on moving away from intensity and attempting an absolute image of the actual properties. And that, that's what really drove me at that time. And here, this was uh, an example of some successful work on that. This is with a phantom. So this is tissue simulating phantom. We placed our, our ring of 32 sources and detectors around the phantom. It contains these rods of different absorbing and scattering um, properties. And uh, this is the cross-sectional images we expected. And these are the images that uh, Toast generated. And uh, we were delighted with this. This, this, was, this, was, this was new. Uh, no one else was doing this. And uh, we were quite excited. Uh, we then applied it to arm imaging as well, which also worked surprisingly well. Um, so uh, this is a couple of MRI images of the forearm of the same subjects we use for, for these images. These are the scatter and absorption images across the forearm. The scatter images clearly show uh, the bones, and the absorption images were probably dominated by, um, by the blood vessels, the, probably the white spots there, but otherwise it's pretty uniform, except where the bones are. Um, we also got into breast imaging at this time. Adam Gibson was, was heavily involved in this work. And um, I, we published quite a lot of work looking back on, on applying this method to breast imaging. In this case, our idea was to place the sources and detectors in a ring and then have the, uh, I was going to say victim, the patient lean up with the breast placed within the ring and then we would inject light into the ring and use the transmitted light to reconstruct an image. We would then reconstruct the properties relative to a reference, which just made the whole process a little easier, make the reconstruction easier. The scan times weren't long, about five minutes per scan, and we, we got some really good results. Uh, this, this is an example of both the, the good and the bad of, of, of diffuse optical tomography applied to breast imaging. This, this patient had, uh, so these were the optical images we obtained, right and left breast, and then afterwards she had a, a, um, a, an, an MRI image using a, a contrast agent. And amazingly, this, this sort of double appearance of the tumour is also reflected in the MRI image. We thought, wow, this is fantastic. We did this with, uh, without an MRI magnet, just in five minutes, non-invasive, really great, fantastic. Um, but however, when you look at the, the healthy breast, you see a feature here, quite uncorrelated to anything in, in, inside the anatomy. It just might have been a bit of dirt on the surface, it might have been a blood vessel over an optode. And that is the problem with optical imaging applied to the breast, is the too, too many false positives. The sensitivity we found to be incredible very, very good. We could see everything, but then we could see more than everything. We could see a lot of things which we couldn't really distinguish between what was healthy and what wasn't. Um, by that time, October 2001, Dave and, and also Tim Mills had built up a really uh, powerful uh, group. Uh, quite a dream team, I, I would say. You can recognise people that are still around today, of course, more than still around. Uh, then we, we got a, a uh, programme grant with the Welcome Trust um, program grant which enabled us to recruit Nick Everdell, uh, Terence Lung, Adam Gibson. I think Ilias joined us about the same time as a PhD student and uh, of course uh, Paul Beard was, was, was brought through by, by Tim Mills and we had a team of, 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 uh, of some brilliant talent at that time and fortunately they've, they've demonstrated that uh, coming through today. Um, okay, 
I'm going to choose my, my seventh paper. This was a, a true game changer. So I'm returning back to the early 1990s, and this paper was among the first, if not the first, to demonstrate the potential of optical imaging as a functional imaging technique. So it, in this case, um, what uh, Hoshi and Tamura did, they just placed some optical fibers in a ring around the head, and then they observed the changes that occurred in the transmission of light uh, when the brain was given a cognitive task, some mathematical problem to solve. And that produces activation in the relevant parts of the brain. You get this extra blood flow, perhaps extra um, uh, uh, difference in oxygenation, which changes the color which the light absorbs, which then changes the, the intensity of light collected at the surface. And uh, this really laid the foundation of, of DOT as it is today, which is primarily a, a, a functional imaging technique, so a, a true game changer. So um, we then, suddenly now everyone was doing this sort of difference approach, do, doing functional images. and, and uh, and that included me too. So we went back and we, we did a whole bunch of uh, different types of imaging to try and see if we could find changes occurring in the brain by quick collecting two sets, two sets of data. So difference imaging say, is much easier mathematically and provides superior quality images. But it does require change to, to occur or to be induced. And um, rather brute force method that we employed was to uh, use a baby on a ventilator and then we change the ventilator set, uh, settings either to either uh, change the CO2, the inspired CO2 or the oxygen and we're able to, uh, as, you, as you increase the CO2 you get an increase in blood volume and also the, the O2 change obviously changes the balance between oxy and deoxyhemoglobin with two different absorption signatures and we're able to get these difference images pretty global uh, changes in optical imaging occurring within the brain, possibly showing the ventricles in the centre, and some perhaps slightly more localised changes in oxygenation, it's hard to say. So that was, that was quite successful. Then uh, I think Adam Gibson took the lead on, on this, this work, which we're very proud of, and I've shown this a thousand times. This is just um, a functional study we did on a series of babies in the hospital where we acquired images with Monster um, during activation, passive activation of the arm. And, um, okay. That's Adam's voice in the background there. Let me just stop there. And the data that we recorded, we, we, we retained light over the entire 3D brain. Um, and we were able to reconstruct 3D images of the brain showing the changes occurring uh, in the blood volume. Uh, within the head and in this particular case we saw a localized change on the left side of the head roughly corresponding to the motor cortex. So these are sagittal slices going from the left ear across to the right ear. So left ear all the way through to the right ear. So this is an increase in blood volume in the left motor cortex possibly indicating a, a, an associated decrease in the frontal region but we, we couldn't prove that. Um, this sudden interest in, in doing difference work sort of drove us towards making devices which are a lot easier to use in, in a hospital. Uh, Dave and Nick Everdell uh, designed a, uh, a system which we, we now call the NTS DOT system. It measures purely intensity at two wavelengths but has been really the workhorse of, uh, of optical imaging here at UCL and we're glad to say elsewhere as well. We've made and sold these systems for other groups around the world and it's, it's been a, a great success. I, I never tire of showing this image. This is one of the first uh, images we have acquired, I think, with the NTS system. We've just placed a relatively small probe of, of uh, optical fibers on the top of uh, a newborn infant as it was going to have a blood sample taken. So once a day, a nurse would come along, stick a needle into the baby's heel and, and extract a small quantity of blood. And of course this hurts and the baby yells and screams. But it also produces a pain response in the head and we hoped that we might capture this. And indeed we did. In fact, the response is enormous. And uh, this, this 
this shows, when that counts down to zero, that's the point at which the needle was stuck into the baby's head. So this is showing change in blood volume measured over the, over the, um, the, the central cortex at the top of the head. And we're seeing an increase in blood volume on, on, on the left side and a corresponding decrease on the right side. And that's because the needle was stuck into the right foot, so you get a, a response on the contralateral side of the head. We're stealing blood from the other side. What I like about this image is there's no averaging. That's the data. The MRI has to average the hell of the data like that to, uh, to, to show you an image. But with optical imaging, no averaging. That's just the raw data shown as a reconstruction. And uh, there is no other technique that could do that. So I'll come to my my final paper and um, this, uh, this, I first saw this, this excellent work by uh, the group of Joseph Culver at a, at a conference and uh, he just blew us away with the, the quality of, of the images that he showed at that conference and uh, I think it brought DOT to a, to a new level, to a new high, really set the standard by which we had to work hard to compete and um, Essentially what they, they, they developed was a very high density uh, probe of sources and detectors which they placed over the visual cortex of uh, the head of, of, sort of bald male volunteers. And then they um, exposed this volunteer to a, a stimulus of a rotating checkerboard pattern. And um, so the, the volunteer would, would focus at a point in the center of this. And so what it's mapping out is a response within the visual cortex to the, um, the, um, the, the, the left and right uh, visual fields. And uh, there's this amazing correlation between the position of the stimulus and the parts of the uh, visual cortex which are being stimulated. And they did some other experiments as well, which, which were equally impressive. And I really think this, this set a new standard, which, which we had to keep up with. So um, a, a couple of years after that, we, we, um, we became more ambitious. We, uh, with, um, with Rob Cooper uh, was uh, taking the lead on this, we were doing simultaneous EEG and optical imaging, whole head optical imaging of newborn infants who are potentially suffering from seizures and uh, we're able to uh, study for a whole hour on a, a, a baby that, uh, although it was sedated, so it didn't move, it nevertheless was uh, suffering multiple seizures. And this is the, the EEG data recorded over that one hour and the corresponding raw data. So these are just intensities recorded between pairs of optical fibers on, on the baby's head. And we see these uh, episodes the, of electrographic seizures occurring uh, uh, over that uh, one hour period with some uh, corresponding wiggles in our intensity data. And uh, I think it was David Holder who helped us interpret this, this uh, EEG data. And we, we identified uh, six, possibly seven, seizure-like events over that period. Then um, what uh, Rob was able to do was reconstruct some images. So this is images projected onto the surface of the brain. So this is the same surface, uh, but three different views. And there's a red line moving from left to right here, showing where we are in the time course. And here we have the corresponding changes in blood volume occurring <coughs> on the cortex of the brain. And during each one of these seizures, we see this sudden pulsing. It goes red to blue very quickly. So we see a, a sudden increase followed by long, slow decrease. This has also been seen in uh, single point measurements on infant brain, but never as a two-dimensional image. And I think for us, this, this was a bit of a landmark as well. In fact, um, we're very pleased with it, but it's, it's hard to interpret what it actually means, and that, that, that really um, has, has been the stumbling block at this point. So, um, well, I'm going to finish by just taking us to where we are today. Um, uh, Gow Labs, who uh, built the NTS and have been quite successful in, in marketing that, have now released a portable modular system known as the LUMO. Uh, already got a few customers, so we're hoping this will, will be a great success. So it also opens up to new areas, new types of uh, potential 
patients that can be studied with this particular device because it is wearable. So you just place as many of these uh, units onto the scalp as you wish, each one supporting a number of sources and detectors. So um, as I return to, to, to research, my, what I'm, I'm currently uh, working on is really to try to get back to trying to get away from just difference imaging all the time. I've, I've got some ideas on how we might try absolute imaging that doesn't require needing two states in order to get an image, how a single measurement can, can give you the information you need. You don't need an underlying change in order to make an image. And that's really what I'm concentrating at the moment. I've got a few ideas about that. Um, so, so coming back to um, Desert Island uh, Docks, um, well, I found the process of, of selecting papers very interesting and uh, at this point I feel I really should say something profound uh, about the directions a career can take and how it can be influenced by people and by, by, by the surrounding research activity that we're, we're exposed to. However, having thought very hard about this, I have to conclude that influences are pretty random. Uh, that opportunities are largely serendipitous and but if we're very very lucky we might find something that is both interesting and also potentially useful. Now being stranded on a desert island with a bunch of papers <coughs> isn't something I particularly relish and um, albeit eight very good papers it doesn't seem like the most useful thing to have when you're on a desert island. But I've given a lot of thought to that too and it has occurred to me how to put them to good use. <laughs> Paper boat. Thank you.